so what we propose to study really is the intersection of um, virtue, happiness, and self-transcendence. We want to study a family of Buddhist-inspired um, self-transcendent virtues that we expect to be closely related to happiness. And more specifically, what we want to do is to develop non-self-report measures for these virtues and then establish the relationship of these virtues to happiness and then finally create simple exercises, simple interventions to um, cultivate these virtues. Now, um, what I want to talk about now is the why, the motivation behind our project. Um, so we believe that few things are as important uh, to personal and societal well-being as a healthy relationship to ourselves. Um, having a self is wonderful. The, all the um, capacities that come with having a self, um, they allowed the flourishing of um, human civilization as we know it. But it's not an unmitigated blessing. It's the so-called um, curse of the self. Um, we know that self-created thoughts and feelings are responsible for a lot of human suffering and a lot of uh, human uh, societal problems. Um, the, the self can be so burdensome sometimes that people try to escape it through um, drugs or alcohol um, um, or even suicide. So um, we really need healthy ways of relating to the self. Um, this is crucially important. And we believe that we need it especially today um, because the last couple of decades, especially in the um, Western, Western world, have witnessed a number of um, uh, phenomena associated with, um, the increase, with an increase in radical individualism and um, a, a shift toward a glorification of a self-oriented worldview. So, for example, um, an increase in self-centeredness and narcissism um, and an, an obsession with appearance and uh, fame seeking. If you cannot read, by the way, Kanye West quote, uh, let me read it for you. Uh, he says, I am Warhol. I am the number one most important ar artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh. <laughs> so um, yeah, there are these, uh, these trends um, that are described uh, by, by observers of the society, and they all indicate that um, we, need, we need healthier ways of relating to ourselves, because um, these trends, they cannot bode well for happiness, individual happiness, or uh, uh, societal welfare. Um, and so we said we want um, to study self-transcendent virtues we, because we believe that they really represent ways of, ideal ways of um, relating to ourselves. Now, virtues are good for happiness. Um, and um, so in a, in a recent paper um, I co-wrote with uh, a dinner, uh, and actually it was for a book uh, edited by Professor Snow. Um, I, re I reviewed the literature on the relationship between happiness and virtue, and there really is um, strong um, evidence that these two are um, associated. And uh, feeling, uh, I mean, doing good, um, it's, it is associated with feeling good, and it also predicts it. So. Um, Happiness and virtue are related, and they are bidirectional. I'm sorry, bidirectionally related, with virtue leading to happiness, and also it's, it seems that happiness uh, leads uh, to virtue. Happier people or people in um, higher positive effect are in a better position to engage in um, behave in virtuous ways. Now, um, and. One finding from this literature review was that all virtues or character strengths correlate with happiness. But these correlations are stronger for certain uh, virtues, and these virtues were, for example, um, love, gratitude, hope, curiosity, zest, and perspective, wisdom. And one thing that we notice when we look at these is that they can all be described as self-transcendent. Um, self-transcendent in the sense that um, they, are, um, they are about transcending the ego and connecting to something larger, some larger force. Um, 
And I think I don't need to convince anyone here that virtues are good and we need more of them, but I want to emphasize the um, urgency of this by showing this um, study um, that I conducted with my um, twin sister, actually. I have a twin sister. She's also a social psychologist, and we did this together. So I know it's very hard to read, but what this is is we looked um, at a large corpus of American books during the 20th century, and we looked at the appearance frequency of virtue-related words, virtues, um, virtue words, um, how frequently they appeared in these books during the 20th century, and there was a significant decline for 74% of the virtues that we have seen. Um, and th th this is the percentage drop in these appearance frequencies. You, um, you see thankfulness, fortitude, kindness, gentleness, and also um, some of the virtues we see here as most associated with um, life satisfaction. They are also here, um, such as wisdom or gratitude um, or even love. Um, so what this means is that the salience of these virtues has um, decreased um, during the um, during the 20th century, its cultural sa their cultural sal salience has decreased, and um, we really want to talk more about virtues. We want to bring them back, and in our project, we want to study self-transcendent virtues, especially um, inspired by Buddhism. Now. Buddhism um, is a spiritual tradition. Um, it talks a lot about the self and how the self is related to suffering. So at the center of Buddha's teachings it's to no is, is the notion that um, suffering and chronic dissatisfaction endemic to human life is rooted in confusion about the nature of the self. And Buddhism also offers a comprehensive account of how one should relate to the self to reduce suffering and achieve well-being. Uh, it says that um, it emphasizes self-transcendence and moving beyond an isolated sense of self by recognizing the imper impermanence, impermanent and interdependent nature of the self. So we believe that um, there is a lot of um, wisdom to harvest in, in Buddhism about a healthy way of relating to the self. Um, and in the past, when uh, psychologists look at uh, uh, Buddhism and um, got some ideas from them, um, such as um, self-compassion or mindfulness, these have been incredibly fruitful um, avenues of research. Okay, so I have talked about um, the theoretical background. Um, as I said, we want to study the intersection of self-transcendence, virtue, and happiness. And how are we going to do that? What is, what is our um, method? Um, so, what we envision is a three-stage project with distinct contributions at every stage. So, the first stage would be, um, I apologize if it's hard to see, in the first stage we want to develop um, non-self-report measures, implicit uh, measures to, um, to um, capture these different self-transcendent virtues. And then, in the second stage, using the tools developed in the first stage, we want to establish the, the, uh, the, um, the association between these virtues and happiness and other desirable um, qualities. Um, and finally, in, this, in the last stage, we want to create scientifically validated exercises that can help people um, develop these, um, these virtues. Now, let me talk briefly about each stage in more detail. So in the first stage, as I said, our goal will be to develop non-self-report measures to capturing um, self-transcendent virtues. And I say that we want to um, develop especially non-self-report measures because we all know that self-report measures, even though they, are, um, they have their strengths, they are very convenient, and some things you you are just the best person to know. No one um, can know better than you, for example, whether you sing in the shower. So self-reports are um, important in that sense. But they also come um, with weaknesses. And um, we, all, we all know that uh, people are not always able or willing to report on their true states. And um, I can show you an example of this by Donald Trump, who says, the new pope is a humble man, very much like me, which probably explains why I like him so much. 
so I, I entertained the possibility that he was being sarcastic, uh, like he was just joking, but I, I don't think he is known for his self-deprecating humor, so I, I'm pretty sure he's serious. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the trouble with self-reports, and we want, to, uh, we want to develop some measures that are um, less, uh, less susceptible to self-serving biases or impression management attempts. And so let me also give you a couple examples of what we want to study, um, the, the types of virtues we want to study. Um, so for example, a sense of the fundamental sameness of the human family is um, one virtue we thought would be important to study. And uh, humility or a quiet ego. Um, and finally, relatedly to uh, perspective or the ability to get out of oneself and see things in true perspective. So all of these um, are self-transcendent in the sense that they uh, emphasize transcending the bounds of the ego and connecting, um, yeah, uh, connecting to something uh, larger than the self. Now, for example, let's say uh, for this first um, virtue, what would be the kind of non-self-report measure that we develop? So this, what we could do, for example, is briefly expose participants to combinations of pictures um, of people from different backgrounds in terms of age, in terms of race, um, and in terms of sex, and then just ask them how similar they think the people in the pictures are um, to each other. And the idea would be that people who are uh, prone to perceive um, the the fundamental sameness of the human family, they might um, see more similarities uh, between uh, these people um, automatically. Um, of course, it is an empirical question, and we don't know if that would be the case, but that would be the, the, type, of, um, the type of tool we would be interested in developing. OK, what about the second stage? Um, in the second stage, as I said, we want to um, establish the associations between these self-transcendent virtues and happiness. Um, so, and in this stage, we would be using mostly correlational and experimental um, studies. And what would be some sample research hypothesis? For example, very simply, on a, uh, it's a correlational study. People who score high in proneness to perceive the fundamental sameness of the human family, they will report higher happiness. Or if we experimentally manipulate this virtue, uh, we might observe that the people who undergo this manipulation will display higher prosociality and lower unethical behavior compared to people who don't, for example. OK, the third stage. In the third stage, as I said, we are interested in translating these findings um, and the conceptual findings into practical exercises. So we would like to come up with some simple exercises that people can use to cultivate these virtues and subsequently um, happiness. So for example, you might think, OK, what simple exercise could make people um, more likely to, uh, to perceive similarities between uh, between other people the, to perceive the fundamental sameness of the human family. So one thing could be uh, we could instruct people to um, think about each time they meet someone or each time um, they meet someone uh, whom they find difficult, um, think about how this person is just like them because just like them they also want happiness and they want to avoid suffering, something like that. And um, in this stage we are interested uh, a lot in creating um, like writing prompts uh, or like, uh, like re self-reflection exercises um, that can be implemented either online or through apps, um, so just like the gratitude exercises um, that, help people, mm, that help people to improve their gratitude. So yeah, this is our project. And I also want to talk about um, the, uh, how we fulfill the deep integration requirement. And this is our team. Again, they couldn't be here today, but let me introduce them to you. So Kurt, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, let me start with myself. I'm, I'm a social psychologist, and I'm interested in, uh, in the study of um, uh, well-being and uh, virtues, and also existential uh, psychology. Um, and Kurt 
is he's a Buddhist scholar and he has many uh, volumes edited and um, translated volumes on uh, Buddhism and he will be our expert on the topic. And Richard Davidson, he's, a, um, he's an expert on affective neuroscience, he's a psychologist. And Robin, uh, she's, a, she's also a neuroscientist and she's interested in the mind-body brain connection um, and she develops novel measures. Um, for those. So we, we will work together at the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, which is itself an interdisciplinary center, uh, and it's a very collaborative um, uh, environment, and uh, this will, um, we believe that it will really uh, provide us the structure to work under. And, okay, anticipated challenges. Um, are, uh, you have to cut me? Okay, okay. Well, then I will just leave you with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I, one question I had about um, thinking broadly about the project, but you brought, uh, you helped uh, focus it for me. What you mentioned under list of virtues included what you called um, uh, perspective mm -hmm. taking, and I, I, I think I understand that you're taking virtue in a very broad sense, not mm -hmm. involving virtues, but one of the other things on your list besides perspective was quiet ego, which is also probably not a virtue, mm -hmm. but an instrumental to possibly being virtuous. And the other one I wanted to ask a question about uh, was what you called the appreciation of the same fundamental sameness of all members of the human family. Well. It's an interesting sort of conceptual issue for all of us to think of whether or not there are certain cognitive states, like actual beliefs that contribute to virtue, whether or not you, right. so in other words, the belief that all people are the same. Mm -hmm. One might look at that. I wonder if you might not need to worry that appreciation of the fundamental sameness of human beings would actually already beg the question that people are likely to treat other people. I'm not sure what kind of mental state appreciation is or what kind of attitude it is, other than something that is displayed in actually behavior. So if you were trying to separate out some virtue component from, from a behavioral component, I wasn't sure about the description of that particular mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, it really goes um, to the question of operationalization. Uh, how do we operationalize these concepts? And um, we really haven't done that yet. Um, but I agree with you that in all these uh, operationalizations, there would be a behavioral component and a cognitive component and possibly also an emotional component that um, support each other. Um, and I think it's a really um, yeah, good idea to explicitly think about these different components that make a virtue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Howard. So I understand the desire to construct the non-self-report measures. What's the process that you will go through mm -hmm. to try to come up with them? Mm -hmm. So it's not clear to me, for example, that the face similarity mm -hmm just establishing the validity of the face similarity judgment as a prospective measurement of appreciation of human similarity mm -hmm. itself is a pretty long process. Right. And, and so I'm just curious what the processes you have for mm -hmm. conceiving of moving forward and developing another measure. Absolutely. Um, so we, we already have come up with a list of potential um, non-self-report measures. And I have only shown one example. and. Um, but other examples include, um, for example, using some cognitive techniques um, such as, um, okay, affect misattribution paradigm. I mean, uh, um, it's a term and I'm not going to go into that. But basically, it's, it makes use of the fact that um, um, you can understand people's attitudes more in more implicit ways. Or um, we have also thought about um, using text, um, uh, people's written text. Um, like, you know, James Pennebaker, uh, he has these, um, these text analysis. So, for example, what can you infer from what people write, from what people write about their virtues? Um, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a really great question, and it's, it's, it's the challenge, really. How do you go about that? But it's really uh, brainstorming a lot, and then um, knowing well the landscape of available tools that are used in different areas. 
um, of psychology um, and then just try to be um, creative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it requires creativity and hard work, absolutely. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi. Oh, whoa. Daniel <laughs> Sullivan. <laughs> um, so uh, you cited Jean uh, Twenge, and uh, she has shown a lot of evidence that over the past 40 years or so, people have become more individualistic, mm -hmm. more narcissistic, and yeah. so on. One of the only ways in her data that people have gotten better is actually recognizing or at least reporting that people are fundamentally the same, recognizing some kind of common humanity. Uh, so her work kind of suggests that those two things can actually develop in tandem or that they have historically, that believing that humans, you know, are part of a common family and being less, you know, prejudiced against outgroups and so on doesn't necessarily contradict or go against a kind of self-centeredness or individualism, uh, at least in the, the work that she's done. Um, so I'm just curious, do you think that that perhaps is an artifact of, you know, people's self-report that maybe people say they recognize the sameness mm -hmm. of humanity and so we need to develop like yeah. new measures or new ways of getting yeah. at that or i'm just curious about yeah. your thoughts on I, it. I, I really don't think um like it, it's the same thing the some the trends that we observe in for example people becoming more tolerant um, um in a on a general societal level and uh like perceiving a, um, the fundamental sameness of um others um I don't know, I'm not sure uh, that's a question, but I, I think still, even if there is an um, increase on that, I mean, we can still use some more uh, increase, right? So it's really um, um, not something we can ever be complacent with, you know, oh, look, people have uh, increased in, the, in their tendency to perceive um, the fundamental sameness of people, uh, of, of each other, so, um, yeah. Yes, Doug. Comment. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the work of Schwartz on these self-transcendent uh, values? Schwartz, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, what he's finding is that benevolence mm -hmm. and um, uh, universalism, is what he calls it, mm -hmm. tend to cluster together as one pole of values. So in that right. sense, you could make that argument for what you're saying, mm -hmm. basically. Right. But more generally, I'm just curious if you see a relationship, direct or indirect, to your work and the work of Schwartz. Yeah, uh, in the sense that um, I think, as you said, like when we talk about self self transcendent virtues, they really fall under that cluster of um, like universalist values. So I would think that um, if we had like people who are high, uh, let's say, on the self transcendent virtues that we want to study, and we map that onto or we um, correlated that with Schwartz's values, uh, I think we would see a certain constellation. I mean, these people they would really uh, as you said, cluster around the universalist and um, the, the, um, the neighboring um, dimensions. Um, and I think it would be, it would definitely be cool to look into that. Would you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other question? All right then, let's uh, pause and get ready for the next one. Thank you.